And welcome to Lighthouse Faith Podcast, where we are moving forward in truth and love. I'm Lauren Green, Chief Religion Correspondent for Fox News Channel and author of the book Lighthouse Faith and the new devotional, Light for Today. This is a very special Easter podcast coming to you on location from Rochester, Minnesota, at Word on Fire Ministries, and many of you may recognize the name as the Catholic ministry created by Bishop Robert Barron. He is an incredible voice of truth and reason in the Catholic Church. Uh, he has written countless articles, books, commentaries. He is the bishop of the Winona Rochester Diocese in southern Minnesota, my home state, by the way. Mm -hmm. Um, but before that, he was Auxiliary Bishop, I believe, of Los Angeles. That's right. Uh, it doesn't matter where he resides. His clarion call is heard around the world. In fact, he's been described by church leaders as one of the church's best messengers. And for this Easter, it's a reminder to those of faith to focus on what the resurrection of Jesus means for uh, Christians and for the countless young people who are starving for spiritual direction. And Bishop Barron has made it his mission to reach them, and he joins me now. Or actually, I'm joining you, <laughs> yeah, because I'm in your offices. It's it's a little strange to be uh, interviewing someone in their own offices, and it's you know, it's this is your show basically. <laughs> well, it's good to be with you. But but you know, like, what is the most important thing to remember about Easter? I mean, if you were talking to a person who had never understood what Easter was or Christianity was, what would you say to them? It's a revolution. Uh, it's an earthquake. It's what turned everything upside down. So one of the worst things we can do is domesticate Easter. We do it all the time. We turn Easter into a nice little spring festival. At the limit, it becomes the Easter bunny. You know, it's a celebration of life. What Easter means is someone who is put to death in the most brutal way possible by the powers of the world. And by that, I mean, you know, by the powers of hatred and cruelty and violence and oppression, this one who is done to death in the most brutal way, God raised from the dead. That means God's love is more powerful than anything that's in the world. That means all tyrants have to tremble. That means anyone that's relied upon threatening others with death have been disempowered. And that's why it's a new world. That's why something new and fresh has opened up. When, when the first Christian said, Jesus is Lord, and, and we hear that in a kind of spiritualized way, but at that time, what they would have said was, Kaiser Curios, Caesar is the Lord, mm -hmm. right? And they knew what that meant. They meant Caesar's in charge. He's backed up by an army. He's backed up by a bureaucracy. And if you cross him, he'll, he'll put you to death. So the Christians blithely say, Jesus Curios, Jesus is Lord. <laughs> what are you talking about? Someone that Caesar put to death is the true Lord. That means the world's been turned upside down. And the clarion call was, get in Jesus' army, not Caesar's army. In other words, get behind this Lord, not the, uh, not the worldly Lord. So from the beginning, it's been a revolution. That's why they wanted to kill Christians. Exactly. And it's a very important point because they got it. See, the, the early auditors of that message, they got it. What are you talking about? Jesus is Lord. You're dangerous. Mm -hmm. What are you talking about? Jesus is, by, by extension, the new king. We better get you, you know, in prison or in your grave. And that's why so many of them, you're quite right, prison or put to death. Um, they were very edgy people. Uh, their, their courage and confidence is remarkable. People without, you know, great education, without any, uh, you know, visible means of support, without an army behind them, they just go out into the world with this message. Think of Paul, you know, walking the Roman roads, but announcing yeah. the lordship of Jesus. And they all went to their death, practically all of them. And that's because uh, uh, their audiences understood what they meant. You know, th that is really the political side of it, but there is a spiritual side of it, too, in that when Jesus was preaching, there was a plethora of gods, they understood, mm -hmm. at that time. So y even the Christians were, they, they, said they thought they were actually atheists because they didn't have these gods for different things, right? Yeah, they, they were not cooperating with the Roman uh, system. See, because what the resurrection, they were Jews to begin with, they believed in, in the one God of Israel, but then the resurrection of Jesus convinced them of the unique power of this God who's made himself manifest in this Jesus of Nazareth, and in raising him from the dead, confirmed Jesus' claim to divinity. So at the heart of his, of his preaching, 
You've got ethics to be sure, but also a claim about himself, right? So Jesus speaks and acts in the very person of the God of Israel. And that's why his, his enemies on the Jewish side would have said, well, this guy is too dangerous. This guy is a blasphemer. In raising him from the dead, God the Father ratifies the claims of the Son to mm-hmm. divinity. And so you're right, that's another dimension of this, of his lordship. He's, he's more of a political lord than Caesar, and he's the God of Israel now in person. Bring those two together, get behind him. He's the Lord you should follow. In many ways, though, the ancients in the first century were actually reacting more authentically yeah. to the claims of Jesus than we are today. Yes, because see, we domesticate him again. And so we turn Jesus into a, a nice ethical teacher, um, articulator of moral principles. And he was that, sure. But he was a revolution. Uh, Jesus coming out of his grave turned the whole world upside down. Um we don't get that, and so Easter devolves into something rather banal. But it's um, it, it's a new world has emerged, mm-hmm. and Christianity is there up and down the ages to say everything's new, everything's different, everything's fresh. Um, abandon the old ways, see, because the old ways keep repeating themselves. Right the, right. the way of violence, hatred, cruelty, division. You know, and that's used by tyrants up and down the ages to the present day. So that old game is still being played. Christianity keeps saying that old game has run its course, and and God has opened up a new world. Um, you wrote a very lovely piece about Lent. Uh, I know that oh, yeah. we're coming to the end of Lent. Yeah. And for, of course, Orthodox Christians, they're kind of in the beginning of their right. Lent. Right. But the idea of Lent, let Lent be Lent, what did you mean by that? Right. What prompted that article, now, if I remember right, is in... Um, in Canterbury Cathedral, one of the most sacred places in Europe, they had a kind of like a disco rave going on. And the idea was to attract, you know, young people. So here's this photograph that kind of angered me um, of the gorgeous, you know, nave of the Canterbury Cathedral. I've visited many times where Thomas Becket, one of the great saints, was martyred for his faith. And we see these kids with their, you know, cups of beer and they're dancing around. <laughs> I thought, no, no, that's not how you draw young people in. Uh, and it's this thing, that, I mean, I took it in as a young man, uh, make it relevant, make it easy, make it pleasant, make it like the world. Well, heck, my generation ran away, see, from all that. So when I said, let Lent be Lent, Lent is a, is a kind of a dire season. It, it begins with the marking with ashes. And in the Catholic tradition, what you say is either, remember you are dust, and unto dust you shall return, or repent and believe the gospel. Both of those are dire messages, last yeah. time I checked, you know, <laughs> meaning you came from the earth, you're living here on, for a time, and you're going to return to the dust of the earth. Death is an absolute uh, certainty, and, and, and uh, don't run from it. I'm going to mark you with it. I'm going to rub ashes on you to remind you of that. That's a dark message. Good. (laughs) Good. We need to hear it. (laughs) Or repent and believe the good news. Yeah, all is not right with you. That's what you're saying. I'm not okay and neither are you. (laughs) We're sinners. And what we need to do is repent. Think of in the Gospel of Mark, the first word out of Jesus' mouth is repent. The first thing he says. So the kind of nice guy Jesus and, you know, let's all get along and God is love and everything's fine. No, no, things aren't fine. <laughs> we're sinners. We're under the, the, the aegis of death. And to be aware of those two truths, that's what Lent is about. Now, it's a, it's a divine comedy. It's moving toward resurrection and life. Yes, indeed. But in the meantime, let Lent be Lent. Right. You know, don't cover that over. You know, it seems as though the generation that you're trying to reach still is in the mindset that Jesus serves me yeah. for my spiritual well-being. <laughs> yeah. Jesus yeah. is going to help me be the better lawyer or singer or, you know, is that what we're getting here? Yeah, no, I think it's a good way to put it. And think of the way Paul introduces himself in his letters. Mm-hmm. Uh, Paul called to be an apostle. So first of all, he's in the passive voice, called. He's not doing the calling. He's, he's not this autonomous subject. I am setting the tone. No, no, I've been called to be an apostle. Apostelain means to send. Mm-hmm. I, I, I'm being sent on a mission. 
I've been called by a higher power. I've been sent on a mission. The game here is not, let's make life comfortable for Paul, <laughs> you know, or let's <laughs> let Paul become more autonomous. No, it's let Paul find his mission under the lordship of Jesus, and Paul will actually then become more himself and will find joy. Think of, you know, when you read Paul's letters, this is not a guy lacking in personality or, or a right, guy lacking right, right, right. in intelligence. He's, his whole personality is on display. But he's not calling, he's called. He's not sending, he's sent by another. Uh, that's a biblical sense of the self. How do you, how do you relate Easter <clears throat> to a generation that thinks spirituality is for their individual well-being? Yeah. Uh, Augustine says sin is to be caved in on oneself. It, it's in curvatus in se, he says in Latin. Mm-hmm. You're, you're caved in around yourself. Um, life is so much more interesting when you move out of that little narrow, boring space. Mm-hmm. And, and you are called by a power beyond you. You're summoned by a life that you can barely imagine. Uh, something so extraordinary has happened through God's grace that it, it confounds all of your expectations. Now you're ready to live. See, there, there's the resurrection faith. Now you're ready to live by following the risen Lord. Um, the, the danger is um, the ego it is like a black hole, you know, that just keeps drawing everything into itself, it draws everything into itself, people around you. <laughs> everything becomes in service of your ego. It, it, it's breaking free of that black hole quality, you know, so that you can actually live and you can you can move out of your boring self into the, into this wonderful world that God's opening up. That's an Easter message. You know, I I, I know that you um, were, were close with the uh, actor Shia LaBeouf who did um, convert to Catholicism, yeah. and it's his life. And I and I know we've brought this up before when we've talked mm-hmm. about um, him and you know the young people but it seems as though as I've reflected on this it's kind of a cautionary tale I mean he represents really what most young people kind of go through mm-hmm. I don't need church I don't yeah. need organized religion yeah. where do you have how far do you have to go down in order for you to kind of think maybe I do there's an old spiritual adage that the only way up is down and it's um, exemplified in, in Dante in the Divine Comedy that he goes down to hell and then up Mount Purgatory and then finally is ready to fly into paradise. And that's the paradigm, that, that often you have to go down to go up. In other words, you have to come to grips with your own sin. And if you try to fly past that, it's not going to work. So Dante, at the beginning of the Divine Comedy, tries that, and he's blocked by these three symbolic animals. You mm-hmm. know? And they compel him to go down. There is, as in so many of the spiritual masters, this kind of hitting bottom experience. And it's like in the 12-step stuff, you know, when you, you find that you hit bottom and then you're ready to turn your life over to a higher power. I think there's some of that in a lot of the stories of, of conversion. I think Shia talked about, I know he did, he talked about that. You yeah, know, He yeah. really hit bottom. And then... And he, and he, he was so successful. And he's still yeah. successful. But yeah. it's the idea here, you've got this young talent. He's, he's hot in Hollywood. Yeah. He's... In the big mega bucks movies, yeah. and my goodness, you would think that is everything that every young person wants. Why is it that we human beings have to live through that story over and over again? Namely, wealth, pleasure, honor, and power. Thomas Aquinas says those are the four things we seek in place of God. So most people, if you ask them when they're young, what will make you happy? Some combination of wealth, pleasure, power, and honor, right? Mm. And time and again, we discover we get all those things. We seek them, sometimes passionately, sometimes dangerously. Uh, Sometimes we spend much of our life after those things. And it's precisely when we get them that we realize, okay, that's not doing it for me. That's not satisfying me. Mm. It's because it's a weird paradox, but it's the whole spiritual life depends upon it. What the soul is hungry for is God, right? Right. God is love. That's what God is. That's God's very nature. Therefore, the route to happiness is not filling up the ego with these four things. It's emptying out the ego. It's, it's mm-hmm. letting go, and it's, it's willing the good of the other. That's the classic definition of love. And when you do that, here's the way it works. It's in all the spiritual masters. When you give away what you have in love, then you get more grace, 
And then you give that away and you get more grace. And then you're in this kind of loop. The more you give of grace, the more you receive. And that's where the saints begin to live. It's, it's the woman at the well problem, right? You come every day to this well and you get thirsty again. I want to give you water welling up to eternal life, says Jesus, right? Well, the well, that's wealth, pleasure, power, honor. Those are all the things that we seek. And you come every day, don't you? You keep trying. Well, that's all of us. We can all identify what that well is. Um, I, I want you to get. I, I want you to leave that bucket behind because I want to give you water welling up to eternal life. That's what I'm talking about. That's grace. Is is learn to give, and you'll find this grace now welling up in you. And I think Shia, in a very articulate way, was able to state that you know that he had been after those four things. Yeah. And they weren't doing it for him. And then I would say through grace, he comes across Padre Pio. He's called upon to play him, meets these wonderful Capuchin friars. He was just there to f- kind of figure out, you know, how do I play this guy? <laughs> but the friars took him in, you know, and um, not in a self-interested way. Most of the older friars had no idea who he was. But they took him in and they treated him with, uh, with love. And they, they brought him into this sacred world, you know. And I think it, it, I know it did. I know it affected him deeply. You know, one of the things you've been talking about, and we've kind of, you know, it, it, it's a word, it's um, something that has disappeared in its real true meaning in our culture today, and the word is sin. Yeah. That because we maybe not understand what sin really is, usually the younger generation, they may not understand what the sacrifice, Jesus' sacrifice on the cross really actually means. What is the definition of sin? There are different ways to do it. One is in the Bible is uh, hamartia, which means missing the mark. So think of someone you know aiming in the arrow at the target, and they, they miss the mark. And so you might say sin is a kind of misdirection of one's life. Mm-hmm. So there's the individual act of sin, but you might say someone living in sin means you're just not aimed right. And that's why you you know you keep missing the mark that you're looking for. But it for. sounds very subtle though. It's it's oh, it can't be that bad. It's I'm a you know, I'm just missing the mark. I'm we, not I'm not a big sinner. Which is why it needs to be balanced by other definitions. So that what the Bible typically does is it will give us a, a, a range of, you know, images and, and mm-hmm. ideas. The other one I, I just mentioned a few minutes ago, the Augustine's famous definition, that curvatus in se, which mm-hmm. I've always loved because I think we all know what that feels like. When, when I'm caved in around the preoccupations of the ego, then my life becomes cramped. So one image is a disordered you know, arrow, but the other is this kind of this black hole quality. This, I'm, I'm caved in around myself into a place of deep sadness. Uh, Dante characterizes the worst sin, so he gets down to the bottom of hell, is Satan. He's not in fire. He's in ice. And I always thought that's a great, not a definition, but it's an image for sin. Because in ice, it makes me do this, right? It makes mm-hmm, me, me mm-hmm. and I'm, I'm stuck. And Satan has wings, because he's an angel, right? But the wings in Dante's imagination become bat wings. And, as he, and he's trying to fly, but he's just making the world around him colder, because he's, he's buried in ice. As he flaps the wings, then, then he produces the cold... Uh, meteorology of hell. And I, I've always loved that image for sin because mm. we've all been there. Yeah. When you're yeah. stuck and you're you're clinging to yourself and, and you're you're beating your wings, I meaning you're you're trying to fly, but all you're succeeding in doing is making the world around you colder and making people unhappy around you. Notice how all of us sinners, uh, but we we radiate unhappiness around us. That's a mark of of the sinful soul. Mm. Um so, I mean, I, I'd use a, a range of images like that. Um, but people would really like to categorize sin as, you know, like the Ten Commandments. Give me a list of things yeah. that I should not do in order for me to avoid sinning. Yeah. But, like, Jesus really kind of explained it more. It's a heart issue, not just yeah. a... No, right, because what he did, Jesus radicalized it. So he didn't make it easier. He made it harder because he was saying behind the actions that you should avoid, there are certain attitudes of the heart that you should stop cultivating. So, yeah. see, I would, like, t- Ten Commandments are like a kid learning a sport. 
and like, all right, here are the fundamentals. Yeah. It's the fundamentals. Right. If you play football, here's the three point stance. Here's how you hand off the ball. Here's how you throw. I remember my baseball coaches when I was a little kid, you know, here's how you stand and uh, when you're fielding. And so the, the Ten Commandments saying, look, you got to avoid these egregious violations of love. So if, if love is the path, right? Right, L- right. Willing to go to the other. Okay. Well, heck, you're not going to steal things from people. You're not going to commit adultery and violate your marriage vows. You're not going to uh, insult God. You're not going to you know, insult your parents. But they're like elemental uh, fundamentals of the spiritual life. So now think of Jesus with the rich young man. who He wants, I, I want eternal life. All right, have you followed the commandments? Yes, I have, since I was a kid. And I believe him. Right. There, there's right. one tradition that says, oh, no, he's just deceived. And, no, no, I believe him. I think he's he's like a, a a baseball player who's learned the fundamentals. And now, but I want to be, I'll date myself, you know, Mickey Mantle. I want to be Roberto Clemente. I want to be Derek <laughs> Jeter. I mean, I, I want to be a real star. Right. Okay. Okay. Are you ready for the serious stuff then? So when the young man says, I, I followed all these commandments, Jesus says, yeah, okay, great. That's good. Uh, now, now sell everything you've got and follow me and you'll find treasure in heaven. Um, he was he was proposing a kind of high octane spirituality, a high octane moral life. Like, okay, you've done the basics. Now let's really get serious about it. Are you willing to hand over your life, see, for the sake of, of God and for the sake of others? Can you sell all you have? Now we can take that literally, but just can I mean, you? Was he was he actually asking the young man? Because I've been faced with a, a lot of people, that, you know, come front yeah. him. It's like, does he was he really telling the young man to sell everything, or was he challenging him to say, "Are you willing to sell everything?" Yeah, I, I mean, I wouldn't hold back from the fact that he he might have intuited, but this kid, no, he really does. He really needs to empty his life out, you know. And there are people in the great tradition who have followed that, who indeed have mm-hmm. you know, surrendered. But I think, yeah, we can broaden it out to say, are you willing to let go of yourself? Are you willing to empty out your ego? You know, mm-hmm. Are you willing to, to let go, open up, stop, stop caving in around yourself? That's the, that's the real challenge. Um, so that's sin. And then grace you know, is what breaks in. God's gift has to come. And, and sort of remake us and open up a fresh space. That's what grace does. I want to talk, Len, we've talked about sin, but let's get to evil, of yeah. actual, real evil. Yeah. And is it possible for young people today to actually recognize real evil? Because just like the nature of sin and Satan's work against us, real evil sometimes is very subtle as well. Yes, there's there's a lot there, and something I found, Lauren. The older I get, the clearer that becomes to me that there there really is evil. Now, metaphysically speaking, evil's a privation of the good. I'm not going to give it that much credit, see, because mm-hmm, mm-hmm. if I say like a Star Wars thing, there's you know the force, the good, and then the evil. That's Gnosticism. That's not Christianity. So evil is always a privation of the good. It's like a shadow. Think of Tolkien. You know those those. Um, what were they called, those riders that, that had these cloaks, and it was revealed when the cloak comes out, there's nothing there. See, th- right, that's right. what evil is. But it but, doesn't mean for one second that it doesn't have enormous power, because that, that, the, the negativity, like a cavity that compromises your tooth, you know, uh, negativity, the, the lack of good, causes immense suffering. Um, within our own souls... When our souls become corroded and corrupted, well, by God, that's a reality, and people suffer from it, the effects of it, and then in themselves they feel it. Um, I mean, I think a lot of young people today look at the spiking numbers with depression, anxiety, right, right, suicidal right, right. tendencies. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, we're talking about real evil there. How do they recognize evil, though? Because there are a lot of things in the culture today that they don't recognize as evil because you've transformed them. At least they've transformed them into my true self. Yes. Yes. You know, well, that's the my old, true self. That's the oldest trick in the book. I mean, that's, you know, that, that famous um, uh, fresco in the Orvieto Cathedral that shows the uh, the Antichrist. And the, the Antichrist looks just like Jesus, looks just like him. But then, he, and then he's gesturing with, with the two arms. But then as you look, oh no, there, there's the devil right next to him who's put his hand in into his vesture 
and poked it out so that it's actually it's the devil's hand. And and the Antichrist is is got his head cocked listening to the devil. The point that he's making there, Signorelli is a great artist, that that's how evil appears. It often looks very good. It looks like the righteous, you know. And you've got to be very attentive. Oh no, wait, wait a minute. That isn't Jesus. That just looks like Jesus. Mm. And that's not the hand of Jesus. That's actually the hand of the devil. Um, what, what's the mark? The mark is always love. Uh, to love is to will the good of the other. When you see love, you see God and you see grace. Um, something can be very attractive. It can be very compelling. But if it's not characterized by love, some other force is at work. You know. Mm. So that's that's the test. Look for love. It is 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 the good of the other being willed here. Or is something else at work? You are making an effort and you are doing so many things to reach young people today. Let's go through the list of what you're actually doing. You've got the Bible out there. Yeah. What other things are you actually doing um, to get the message out to specifically young people? And also, why is that important? Yeah. Well, I mean, my focus really is anyone who's watching or using social media. So maybe it's predominantly younger people, but I think more and more it's pretty much like everybody. The Sunday sermons, uh, we started those actually after COVID, because mm -hmm. I, I did a online mass during COVID, but then I wanted people to come back to church, so we stopped doing the mass, but I continued with the sermons. And those have gone, I mean, all over the world. Those are followed. I was in Rome for the Synod last October, and you mm -hmm. know, bishops from all over the English-speaking world, and they were all coming up to me saying, you know, my, my people listen to the sermons. and So that's an important outlet, out, outreach. And the, um, the Bible you mentioned... You know, which has the the one that we've produced has the biblical text, but also has beautiful works of art, and then it's filled with commentaries from the great, mostly spiritual tradition. Mm -hmm. Not so much technical theological commentary, but spiritual commentary, and that's the kind of book I want someone maybe who's drifted away from the church to to find attractive that they'd be drawn into it. Um, you know, we do the uh, podcasts and we do the YouTube videos still. Um, I'm making longer uh, films. So we've done you know, two major documentaries. I'm working on a third. So I'm just trying to do whatever I can and to move into that space where most people live. And we know that. I mean, the media are changing, aren't they? You know, all over the place. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And people are using more and more social media and, and the video world. So I'm just trying to get there. I'm trying to be in that space. And we found over the years, I've been doing this now for about 20 years, um, it's working. You know, uh, we didn't know in the beginning if we'd find an audience for this thing. Uh, and we have. We have, you know, a, a pretty successful, uh, successfully found an audience. So, you know, I think just I keep going. You know, I mean, the, the parish church, it, it exists, but it's so much larger than a community. It's I mean, changed. it's, a, you know, a, a geographical community. Yes, and see, all that's changed in the course of my lifetime. When I was a kid, it was certainly, the you know, the Catholic parish. That's where we want. And we still want people, of course, to come to Mass. That's the <laughs> ultimate goal. But I've been saying this for years. We can't just have programs in our parishes and expect uh, people, especially younger people, to come. We have to move into their space. The ultimate goal, I would say, as a Catholic, is to bring them to the Eucharist and to Mass. But I think we have to move into their space and, and just be a presence there. And I hope to do it honestly, respond to questions people have, and present the faith in a truthful and beautiful way. And just your last thoughts on encouraging people this Easter. I would say um, let Easter be Easter. So <laughs> don't let it be domesticated. Don't let it be co-opted. Rediscover the radicality of Easter, that it's a subversive feast. Um, Christianity by its nature is subversive. It turns everything upside down. And there's nothing more subversive, literally subversive, than the resurrection of Jesus from the dead. Um, we want to believe that the new world if you look, it's interesting, look on the back of the dollar bill and you see the, the little pyramid with the eye and then underneath it, Novus Ordo Seclorum, right? The new order of the ages. They thought that's it, 18th century, you know, the enlightenment and rationalism and, and political revolution, all of which is great. I'm in favor of it, but it ain't the Novus Ordo Seclorum. <laughs> the, the Novus Ordo Seclorum happened on this uh, grimy little hill outside Jerusalem when they put this young rabbi to death but God raised it from the dead. And that's the new order of the ages. That's what Easter is about. 
Wonderful. Thank you so much, Bishop Robert Barron, Word on Fire Ministries. Thank you so much, the Bishop of Rochester or Winona Rochester Diocese of Minnesota. Thank you so much. You're welcome. My pleasure. And thank you all for listening to this wonderful uh, Easter episode of Lighthouse Faith Podcast. Have a blessed day and have a blessed Easter.